Hello and welcome to episode 33 of the Chronicles of Aguna, brought to you by loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu. But this evening, or this week, I should say, I've got a co host. It's Mr. Mike Stavrou, which means you don't have to listen to my monologue at the beginning of this week's show. Um, so, Mike, welcome. How are you doing, mate? And thanks for agreeing to co host. It's always a pleasure, Harry. Always a pleasure. I love to hear your velvet voice, as I've told you many times. <laughs> yeah, I'll just, I'll just, a bit of a disclaimer. Uh, apologies if you hear any fireworks in the background. Um, there's a lot of fireworks going on, similar to Arsenal, how we played against Liverpool yesterday. Hey, <laughs> he's got it. There in. he is. He's got it in. <laughs> he's got it in. That's why we got you on, man. For great. Uh, That's what I'm here for, man. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Mike, uh, a one-one draw in the end with Liverpool. Uh, you could probably say that we deserved a little bit more. I think that's the general consensus amongst Arsenal fans. I've been spoken to a few people since the game. Me, I'm of the impression that it could have gone either way, to be honest. I thought Liverpool had some really good chances as well, particularly the ones that fell to Virgil van Dijk. Would you say it's a fair result overall, in your opinion? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you can't help but feel disappointed when you know you play as well as we did and we really did play well we we're looking like a well old machine now uh, harry it's the, it's the defensive unit that are cohesive and it's not just the back four it's the whole team that are buying into emery's plan and it's the it's defensive in terms of the press from from the front and we've seen in about 10 12 games from the beginning of the season just how well organized they are now and I feel like they're buying into into Emery, and it's it's really showing on the pitch. I thought yesterday's game, um, I didn't think Liverpool were that great to be honest, Harry. I think the front three, Mane, Firmino, and Salah, are not really firing at the moment. And a quick note on Fabinho. I mean, what is it with these Monaco midfielders? Because they they might have to send him packing as well as Bakayoko for Chelsea because he was awful. Yeah, I don't know what's happening there. What do you, what do you think of Fabinho? Uh, I haven't been impressed with him whenever I've seen him play, to be honest. I know he hasn't featured too much for Liverpool this season, but when I have seen him, I've been disappointed, if I'm honest. Um, but also, I think Granit Xhaka and, and Lucas Torreira made him look bad. And, you know, I don't think there's any doubt now that those two will and should be our pivot going forward, our midfield pivot. You know, a lot of people were, were sort of on the fence. There were those calling for Gwenduzi to come in. Um, but for me, yesterday proved that, that that is the pair. And I, and to be fair, I've been saying that for quite some time now. Would you agree? You know what? Stop the press, Harry. I'm going to I'm gonna talk up Granite Xhaka. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's finally time. And, you know, people might call me fickle. But listen, I'm I'm going to compliment the, the players when they deserve it. And granted, Xhaka, the last few has been really, really good. I think when you give him a specific role uh, where he can receive the ball, he's, his range of passing is good. And I, I have to say, even on the defensive side, where I wasn't that sure about it, he's been timing his tackles better. I remember when Salah came inside yesterday and it was a bit of a loose touch but Xhaka he was measured in his tackle and he, he timed it perfectly and he's, he's not really been doing that so oh we lost you there know, Mike. It, yeah, go on. but yeah I'm not sure what, what Emery's done and but he's improved so many players not just Xhaka Harry but Alex Iwobi it looks like a completely different player um, like I, I was calling for him to, to take Mkhitaryan off and bring Iwobi off and Last couple of seasons, when would you ever have said that, bring Alex Iwobi on? But now he looks like a different man. Yeah, totally agree. And, you know, just touching on that Granite Xhaka tackle that you mentioned, you know, I must admit when I saw him chasing Salah back, I thought this is going to end one of two ways. He's either going to yeah, completely mistime it, take him out and give him a foul or, or, or whatever. Or, you know, he, he's just not going to get anywhere near him. But credit to him, you know, he stuck at it, got his head down, tracked back really, really well. And eventually made a good tackle. So I, I think you're right. I think players have improved. I think it goes to show that these players do have ability. I think nobody could ever question Arsene Wenger's ability to identify good footballers. And I think with people like Granit Xhaka, we've seen that again. You know, we've seen that he identified a good yeah. footballer. But obviously, he wasn't getting the maximum out of him. And he wasn't getting the best out of of who is someone who's obviously a very good footballer. Um Lucas Torreira, 
was fantastic yesterday. I mean, what does oh, yeah. he add to the midfield that we've been missing in, in your eyes? Oh, what doesn't he add? I mean, Harry does absolutely everything. He's he's great receiving the ball. He's so composed. And that composure, I think, that Torreira has when he receives it echoes around to the whole team because I'm suddenly seeing Mustafi confident on the ball, holding confident on the ball. Leno, who, who is good on the ball anyway, but Torreira just gives them that option. And I think that um, he's, he's good at picking the ball up and then driving forward as well, Harry. I think his passing's good. He's um, there was a there was a chance that he had yesterday when he, he he kind of like ghosted through because because no one thought he was going to shoot and he just kind of dribbled through it was, it was straight at um at Allison in the end but and that not even mentioning his, his defensive side yet which is obviously his best asset he's tackling and his his anticipation and from a player in so long I remember as well I was I was having a laugh the other day because on Twitter. Um, people were, were talking about Francis Coquelin and when he came through everyone was thinking oh this is the defensive midfielder and then two minutes later he was getting spun into oblivion by Eden Hazard but um, Torreira is, is the real deal Harry for me because he's, he's got the whole package yeah he has he has and I saw quite a bit of Lucas Torreira um, last season during his time at Sampdoria because I was covering Italian football for a couple of different um, a couple of different magazines and stuff and was doing regular mm. articles on that and I'd actually said to a few of my mates and, and they can vouch for this that Torreira is a player to, to watch out for you know he's someone who's um, he's got a lot of grit a lot of determination he's very good on yep. the ball his anticipation is excellent my only worry was and this sounds a bit sh- well you might think it's stupid but my worry was his size um, when it came to him coming to the Premier League because he is very small um, he's actually a lot stronger than he appears on the ice so I guess that's why yeah. he's been okay um, and in fact he's been better than okay hasn't he? he's been brilliant but you know he is a player that you only need to watch once or twice to understand what he's all about and to understand where his strengths lay so when I, I heard we were linked with him I, I was absolutely thrilled yeah now you, you mentioned say about the size, sorry, Harry, but yeah. you know, look at look look at some of these defensive midfielders. Lord Makaleli, he was only small, but tough tackler. Now you got N'Golo Kante, Marco Verratti. You know, it doesn't like size is you know it's. I mean, not in, in not in all circumstances, but size doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, and I think that he just. He's he's such a revelation. You know, and I'm I'm so glad we got someone like, like yeah. that. Size doesn't matter. You know, that's what the little people tell themselves. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but we'll, we'll leave that there anyway. Um, you, you touched on Burn Leno as well. There, um, Burn Leno had a mixed game for me. Um, he came out flying like Superman uh, for that header that ended up coming off the post. I think it was Van Dyke's header, wasn't it? Was it Van Dyke? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he came out like a, a, an absolute madman and absolutely clobbered the Liverpool centre-half there. And he was nowhere near the ball. I mean, that sort of, of judgment, he, how can I say it? He needs to improve in that area, I think, because he was a little bit rash there. He probably would have been better off staying on his line. Um, I, I guess you could argue that he put the, the, the attacker off a little bit. But, mate, that was way too risky. And, and then there was obviously the goal... Yeah where he, again, came flying out like Superman. And um, he was a bit unlucky there because his punch or flap, whatever you want to call it, ended up coming off Rob Holding and and landing perfectly for Milner. But even still, uh, I'm not entirely sure I want to see my goalkeeper doing that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I have to I have to agree, Harry, and I think we're beginning to see why he made the most mistakes in the Bundesliga last season. Um, he seems a bit rash. You know, we've got a, we've got a perfect example of how not to be as a keeper uh, in our in our bitter rival Spurs with Hugo Lloris. He comes flying out like that, and it's like Leno doesn't think it through before he does it, and it's just instinct. And that's not really a trait that you want in a keeper. And in in games like this, luckily it didn't cost us. But where the margins are so fine, you know, we got Spurs coming up. Imagine Leno makes a rash decision there and does something silly. So it, it does worry me. And I do wonder whether, you know, I'm still not sure if, if Emery's sure really who is his number one. I mean, Leno has been starting recently, but in, in bigger games, you know, if, if he's seen what Leno can do and he can be a liability, will he go back for check? I don't know. What do you reckon? 
I'm not sure. I, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because they've, they've both got their strengths and they've both got their weaknesses. I think we've seen that Pedacek is very uncomfortable with the ball at his feet. Yeah. And that's caused us problems at times. But he's also a lot more dominating in aerial situations. He comes out and gets things. Um, I don't think he would have come out for that uh, Van Dyke header that ended up cannoning off the post. I think Czech would have probably stayed on his line there. Yes, he's a little bit slow getting down sometimes, and, and Leno's a, a great shot stopper. But I just think sometimes you just need a cool head. You need that mm. calmness between the posts. And I think I think you're right. I think Emery will will really be uh, struggling to to identify clearly who his number one is at present because you know, we, like I said, we've seen bits and pieces from both that make strong cases. But then we see things like. Yesterday, where I, I look, yesterday was a fantastic performance, and I don't want to dwell on a negative, but it is a concern for me. Bern Leno's performance was a concern for me. Having said that, he did make a really good save again from Van Dijk. Um, I think that was in the first half when he sort of came out, and made himself big, and then you know the save where he pushed the header over the bar. A lot of yeah, did that. I thought that was pretty routine, though. To be honest, it was right down his throat, and I'd have been disappointed if he didn't save that. So. I don't know, mixed bag with the goalkeepers. I'm not sure what to make of it. And I guess Emery's got some some real thinking to do. Yeah, I mean, you, you know what it is, Harry? The, the fact that we're even picking up on these minor details in a game like so big like Liverpool. I mean, I, I was looking at some stats before the game and I was getting really worried because we haven't we hadn't bit before last night's game, we hadn't beaten uh, Liverpool in six Premier League games. That's right, yeah. So I was really, really concerned. And the fact that we are picking up on these tiny details and the fact is that we did play so well and we did take the game to them. Like Because I, I remember we were talking as well before saying that you know if, if we don't start fast, Liverpool will take us apart. But we, we didn't allow them to take us apart. And the fact that Van Dijk could have had a hat-trick tells you all you need to know um, about the chances that we didn't give their front three. But I think another slight concern, Harry, I'll say, is our defensive organisation from set pieces. I think we gave away a lot of chances. Van Dijk had a free header for that save you're talking about that, that Leno made. And that, that can't be happening as well. So we need to fix that for me. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. And I think I, I noticed that against Leicester, particularly at home a couple of weeks back on a Monday night. Um, you know, we were leaving players free and, and Maguire ended up having a, a free header, which Bern Leno saved. But still, you shouldn't be giving those chances away mm-hmm. from set pieces. You know, at, in a set piece, you've got time. To, to look at the situation and set yourself. So there's really no excuse for it. But like I said, look, I, I don't want to dwell on the negatives. The positives are we came from a goal down against a very strong side, despite most people thinking that we were going to get absolutely hammered. I thought we took the game to them at times and we had some really, really good spells where Liverpool were up against the ropes. You know, Alex Lacazette, what a finish. Fantastic. Oh. Got a question what Alisson was doing out there, speaking of goalkeepers. Um, he seemed to get dragged out but again the pass from Iwobi as well brilliant and and like you said he's a player who's come on leaps and bounds now um, anything else you want to add on the Liverpool game before we move on from that yeah I mean let's just you were just talking about but let's talk about that Alexandra Lacazette finish oh my word that was that was Thierry-esque wasn't it Harry I oh, mean the way incredible. He, the, the best part about that goal is that he's not looking at at the goal he knows exactly where it is and he he squeezes it in between the keeper and about three or four players and I'm like how did he find that little section of the net that it could have gone without even looking and it's just because his striking instincts are, are unbelievable and, and I'd say a lot better than than an Aubameyang to be honest with you in terms of his his all-round play and but it's so good to have them two in the side and just just talking a bit about that, it, it was a bit strange when um, Emery took off Aubameyang because I think we lost a bit of momentum going forward. But the good thing is that he quickly realised that and he thought, OK, we've lost a bit of ground here. Um, I'm going to change it up. And then he, he brought Iwobi on. So, you know, I think substitutions have played a big part for us, um, Harry, under Emery. And, you know, hopefully he continues to keep doing the same job. Yeah, that's right. And I guess it's we've got some strength in depth now, haven't we? Because we've got players on the bench that you can turn to in moments of crisis, you know, and I know he's leaving, but Aaron Ramsey is, yeah. he's a very capable substitute. Um, you know, like you said, iwobi has been brilliant when he's come on. I was a little surprised by the selection yesterday. I thought it was a little bit dangerous, if, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, having Ozil, Mkhitaryan and Aubameyang 
in behind Lacazette. I was a little bit worried, um, but they all worked fantastically hard and and and, and covered things and made me eat my words to be honest because I, I remember having a phone call with my dad actually um a little while before the game and we were like well my dad initially brought it up but then I was like yeah what is he doing like it, it seems so yeah such an aggressive selection and and one that could see us you know if we start on the back foot we, we could be in trouble here um but fair play to him it worked the players worked they put in a shift and I guess that's all you can really ask for isn't it um talk, yeah. talking yeah. about Aaron Ramsey um I wrote an article on Aaron Ramsey on the Chronicles of Aguna website. I think I put it out on Friday, I think it was. So check that out, chroniclesafc.com. Um, and I was talking about why I think the club have made the right decision in allowing him to leave and why I think that this whole thing is, is it just isn't personal. It isn't personal to Aaron Ramsey. And, and I, I get... I don't. What I don't get, sorry, is is why people are sort of up in arms. You know, he's been disrespected by the club, this and that. You're not disrespecting him by not paying him a stupid wage. And and you know, as I said in the article, I'll let you read it as well. It goes into a little bit more detail. But what I talk about is the fact that Unai Emery's realised that you know, in his squad, he's got a lot of midfield options. And, you know, finances are restricted at the club at the moment. We all know that. We know we can't go out and, and hit the top of the wage bracket and, and get the top, top players. So, and particularly now, we're, whilst we're not in the Champions League. So he's decided and the club have decided that that money is better spent elsewhere. It's better spent bolstering the rest of the squad and, and improving in positions where we're lacking. Um, you know, it's just unfortunate for Ramsey that his contract coming to an end has coincided with the Emery takeover. But, you know, there's people suggesting that this had nothing to do with Unai Emery. This has everything to do with Unai Emery because if it didn't, he'd be selecting him, surely. Do you not agree? Yeah, of course. And um, I've got to say, I did read that article, uh, Harry. There's a lot of spelling mistakes, so you might want to send it to me before you put it out next time, yeah. Where's this? No, what are you talking about? <laughs> about no, I don't know. I didn't know. It, it was good. It, it was a good article. No, I, I mean, I, I have to agree with you. I think um, obviously Arsene Wenger believed in him um, and he continued playing him even through bad patches. He, he did have some very good times at Arsenal. I remember, you know, 2012, 13, I think it was scored like 15, 16 goals. It was amazing. But, you know, he hasn't been able to replicate that. And uh, I think Emery's come in, new ideas, new boss, and Ramsey doesn't fit his system. It's as simple as that. You're right, there's nothing personal. Um, I don't really think he, he he fits the team. I don't think he's he's good enough to play any of the positions that we play. I don't think he's good enough as a, as a number ten. I don't think he's good enough to play um, as one of the two defensive midfielders. So Emery's looked at it and said, "Look, I'm not going to spend 200k a week. I, I might as well go out in January and get someone else who I can pay that money who does fit the system better." So yeah, I mean, for, for me, it'll, it'll be a bit sad to see him go because he's been at the club a long time. But Harry, to be honest with you, like if he's not if he's not going to get aside, what what's the point? Also, quickly, I, I don't know if this is true. I did hear this. Is um, Mkhitaryan on about two hundred k a week as well? Do you know? I've heard that he's on around about one hundred and fifty k a week. Not sure <laughs> how accurate that is. Yeah. Um, That's looking like a lot, though, isn't it? Like con- considering the output. I mean, he he didn't look that great yesterday. And he's not looked good for a while for me. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. But what what I will say is. That is a transfer that was done during the Wenger era. And whilst the club mm. can't go back and undo that, they can stop further mistakes happening. And it's not that Aaron Ramsey signing would would be a mistake. I, I do think he's a useful player. I think he gives you a lot of work rate. He does chip in with goals, does get into good positions. And it's not for a second that I don't rate the player. It's more a case of... And, and sorry, I, I don't think that Unai Emery particularly doesn't rate him either I think what has happened here is we all are all aware that Arsenal's finances are restricted we all know that particularly now with Kroenke about to take full control of the club we know that this club is going to become uh, even more adherent to the self-sustaining model that we've been operating for the last however many years yeah. and so to from Unai Emery's point of view it's not that he doesn't want the player but it's, can I afford to tie up such a huge proportion 
of my wage budget on this player. That's the thing. That's the thing. Yeah. That's it. And 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 he's not he's not willing to do that. And I I agree with him because if I think if you say to me what's Aaron Ramsey's biggest attribute, big biggest strength, I will turn around and say to you work rate. Well, you don't need to pay two hundred thousand pounds a week for work rate. You can yeah. find that elsewhere for a lot cheaper. And and that's probably the angle Emery's coming from and looking at it. And I, I don't know, I, I, I'm sick and tired of hearing people say, oh, it's not Emery's decision. Emery would have had an input on this. He would have had a say on this. Do you not, do you not think? Yeah, I think as, as head coach, obviously, he doesn't get involved in the financial aspect as much. But obviously, the higher powers would have said to him, look, like, do, do you think he's worth giving a new contract? And Emery, it looks like he's he, he's probably said no. And um, I, th- I think Ramsey's panicking a bit now, Harry, to be honest with you, because he's come out and, and talked about this quite openly. And um, he, he's thinking, well, you know, if I'm not going to get a contract, where am I going to go? Because I don't think that he would fit into any of the any of the top six teams in the league. So if he's if he's not getting in there, he, he might have to go abroad. And you know, like what, what British players are like going abroad, it's not really plain sailing for them. Unless they're going to America and they're, you know, going to get a massive, massive pay rise. So, you know, I think he's starting to think, you know, I've got a bit of an issue here. So it, it might, it might get to a point where Ramsey's demands for wages get a lot lower, and and we do say to him, you know what, like we'll we'll, we'll bump you up twenty, thirty thousand, maybe not up to two hundred, but it, it, it might happen. I don't know. But it, it looks at the moment like he's not going to sign. But if he gets closer and closer to, to the transfer deadline day and he hasn't got you know any deals brewing, it might happen. I don't know. Yeah, you never know. You never know. Never say never. Um, anything can happen. I, I don't think it will. I think he's got off. I think uh, his pride will get in the way of that anyway. Um, as in, I don't think he'll be willing to turn around and say to the club, yep, actually, you know what, about that deal, uh, if you're willing to uh, still put it on the table, I'll take a pay cut. I, I don't think that will happen. Mm-hmm. Um, be nice, but but I can't see it. Um, speaking of Englishmen going abroad, Reese Nelson. I know you want to talk a little bit about him and how wonderfully he's getting on at Hoffenheim. Yeah, I mean, really unbelievable. So I do follow a bit of German football, and uh, Hoffenheim are my German team. If I'm allowed to say that, I don't know. I think I am. Um, but yeah, uh, Julian Nagelsmann. He's a revelation, and what he's really good at is working with a really small budget and developing young players. And Reese Nelson is one of those players. And he's, I read a stat, um, he scored yesterday, which was his fifth Bundesliga goal. And he's the third youngest player ever to score five Bundesliga goals. Um, and one of those three is Lucas Podolski, who, who we know well, absolute rocket of a left foot. But yeah, Reese Nelson, he looks like an exciting prospect. I think the Bundesliga is a good place to to ply your trade as a youngster because the standard is slightly lower um, and what he needs is, is game time and if he was at Arsenal even though he has been impressive I don't think he'd get that so I think it's a route that we'll see a lot of a lot of young English players taking now especially with Jadon Sancho as well obviously doing very well at Borussia Dortmund and um, there's a, there's talks that Emil Smith-Rowe might join uh, Nelson at, at Hoffenheim which, um, which would be a good move for him so you know I, I hope to welcome back Nelson next year, maybe two years if he wants to stay another one, and really welcome back you know a more mature player that that can maybe start for us. Because Harry, you you will probably agree with this as well. We we need more wingers in in this side. The fact that we're playing a Bamiang on on the wing is kind of like fitting him into a system. What Emery really wants is is uh, wingers who can play in that position naturally. What do you reckon? Yeah, totally agree. I think if you look at, at our squad. That is a position that is crying out for reinforcement, isn't it? Um, in terms of numbers and in terms of quality. So don't disagree with you there. I think you're right. I think the move for Nelson was a good one. I said it when it happened, actually, that I felt yeah. the Bundesliga, like you said, has a slightly lower standard, which means he can play every week and he can get gain confidence and perform. But it's also probably the closest to the Premier League in terms of style. And and so that helps, you know. It, you can go to Italy and play, and yeah, I agree with that. I'm not saying that the Italian league isn't tough because I follow it a lot, and it's actually a fantastic league, and you know doesn't get the credit that it used to anymore for for various reasons. But it is difficult. It just poses different challenges to the Premier League, 
whereas the Bundesliga probably is the closest in terms of style and therefore the same issues you'd, you'd get in the Premier League, you'd probably get them in the Bundesliga too. So I think, you know, I think it's a good move. I think he's, he's done very, very well since he's gone there. You can see he's playing with confidence, celebrating goals with a huge smile on his face and he yeah. just looks really happy. And, and I think, guess for a youngster developing, that's what you want. He has to be enjoying this football, doesn't he? Yeah, of course. And it's it, don't get me wrong. Like I, I was taking a bit of a dig at, at British players there, and it's it's not easy as a youngster. You know, Reece Nelson's eighteen, and packing up your your bags and leaving your family, leaving your friends to move to Germany, a place that you, you can't speak the language, you don't know anyone. This is a scary thing at eighteen years old. I, I know me at eighteen years old. I was an absolute mess. Even when I went, even when I, when I went to uni up north, I was like, oh my god. So to, to move to move to a different country. And be under that kind of pressure, you know, in front of loads of fans every week. It is a difficult thing, and it just shows the it's a testament to the kind of character that that Nelson is. The fact that you can take that in your stride and really, you know, go and express yourself, it, especially for flair players as well. Harry, it's, it's difficult because you need a lot of confidence to do what you do. And to see how ne- the the goal, the goal we scored yesterday was phenomenal. Like he, he's taken it on from such an angle and bent it into the top corner. That is confidence personified. And um, I'm, I hope he continues, and I, I would encourage a lot of more, lot younger players to go out there to Germany and um, and play. And you, you're right, it's a very similar style in the in the sense that um, it's fast, so it's it, it's end to end. There's a lot of goals in the Bundesliga, and that's probably the best place that um, that players can go. And then when they come back, it won't be such a massive jump. That's right. They won't have such a culture shock, isn't it? Yeah. Um, except you know the crowds are a lot better out there and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, he won't be playing in any and libraries. And he drink in the stands as well, which, which you can't do here. Yeah, yeah. But I think, you know what? I think we should arrange a trip to go and watch Reece Nelson one week. What do you think? Let's do it. <laughs> Cross <laughs> so of, of a gooner abroad. What do you tour, reckon? On tour. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. Love. Lovely. Great stuff. Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, bloody hell, that half an hour has absolutely flown by. Um, fantastic stuff. And, and thanks for joining me once again. Um, and you know, hopefully we'll, you'll be on as a co-host much more in the, in the near future. And it'll be great to have you on board. Always happy, Harry. When, whenever you need me, I'm here. Great stuff. Great stuff. Do you want to quickly let our listeners how, uh, listeners know how, sorry, they can uh, follow you on social media. Yeah, of course. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. It's at Mike underscore Stavru. I hope you can spell that. It's a Greek name. So, uh, all my, all my Greek listeners out there, hopefully you get it. English listeners. It's S T A V R O U. It's not that bad, to be fair. There's much no, worse Greek ones. It could be like yeah. Baba Stathopoulos or something. And <laughs> yeah, good luck. Really need the dictionary. But yeah, no, that's it. That's all good. And also, Mike produces uh, the Breakfast Show on Love Sport Radio. Is that on Sundays, Mike? Yeah, that's on Saturdays and Sundays, Saturdays from, and Sundays. Um, from 8 till 12. You can get us on, um, on 558 AM on your, in your car if you're listening. Come over. It's a, it's a lot of fun. It's with you and Thomas the uh, former Olympic silver medalist and Paul Mortimer. Great stuff. Do check it out, guys. Uh, you won't be disappointed. And now and again, uh, I'll pop up on there as a guest. So you'll definitely love it. There you go. That's all the encouragement (laughs) you need. (laughs) That's it. Lovely. Mike, thanks very much. And we'll speak again very, very soon. Cheers, Harry. I'm going to take a short break. And when I return, I'll be talking to Chris Davison. Enjoying what you've heard so far? If so, make sure you hit that subscribe button and leave us a review on iTunes. Welcome back to the show, Chris Davison. How you doing, mate? How's your weekend been? Yeah, thanks for having me back on, Harry. Um, it's been um, it's been a good weekend, thank you. Um, you know, a little bit happy with the, with the result. Obviously, um, didn't get the three points, but um, you know, I think looking back at the game, definitely happy with a draw. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still a happy goon. You know, I'm beating rungs, still going on. That's it, of course. And uh, would would you say that the draw was a fair result? Because you know, there's a lot of Arsenal fans saying that we deserve to win it. I don't actually share that opinion. I think a draw was a fair result upon reflection. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I can see, I can see where you know most Arsenal fans are coming from, with you know, in regards of you know feeling a little bit unfortunate um, that we didn't get the win because we did push hard. You know, we did have quite a few good opportunities, but yeah. Then yet again, so did so did uh, Liverpool. So um, you know, I think looking back at it, you know, both teams had their fair share of chances. Um, uh, and obviously, there's a there's um, 
you know, uh, a lot of people talking about Liverpool's disallowed goal in the first half. Um, from Mane and saying that saying about how that should have still counted and stuff like that. But you know, looking back at it, you know, Arsenal done well to to come back and sort of keep Liverpool at bay in the second half. What did you make of that goal? Did you think it was a correct decision to disallow it? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, everyone's sort of split on it. Um, I mean, looking back at it, um, uh, you know, I haven't. I've actually only seen it seen it the once actually, Harry. Surprisingly enough, um, when it actually happened in the match. Um, but looking back at it, it did look Mane, like Mane was just on side um, when Firmino uh, had that opportunity. Um, whether or not you know that is the case again, I'll have to have a look at it. But um, that's what that's what I sort of brought away from it um, when I saw it. Yeah, I think the main argument is that um, in the first, so he's definitely on side when Firmino squares it. There's no doubt about that. But I think the argument mm. is when the initial ball comes in. He makes a move towards the ball and then it depends on whether the linesman deems him as active or not because he does sort right, of make okay. a, a move towards it and then he pulls away. So I guess, yeah. you know, it's down to interpretation and that's always going to split opinion, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, one of those 50-50 ones. Who'd want to be a linesman, that's what I say. That's right, that's right. Right, Chris, we've got some listener questions uh, coming through. Um, these have been sent to us via Twitter, a couple of them through Facebook. So thanks to those of you who have contributed and to those of you who have sent them after recording, I am sorry because we're bound to get some late stragglers. We always do. Um, and this first one is from at will underscore M 53 on Twitter. He says, it's a bit of a three part question. Actually, he says, what do Arsenal need to do in order to maintain this positive start to the Emery era? Do we need to strengthen in January, bring Nelson back from loan? And what would our centre-back pairing be, sorry, when Lauren Koscielny and Socrates both return? So starting with the, the strengthen in January, Chris, I think we'd all agree that we, we will need to strengthen at some point. What would be the key areas for you? Um, I mean, it's a tough one because we, I, mean, I know we've done a lot of business in the summer, but then there was still a few people saying that we needed another winger or um, Mustafi still isn't good enough. Uh, so you know, it's a bit, of a, it's a bit of a weird one. I mean, I know um, you know we've been struggling at left back with the fitness fitness of um, Monreal and Kalashnikov. Uh, you know, I think um, you know when when they're both fit, I think we've got a couple of good you know left backs to choose from there and. Um, Kalasanak's, you know, impressed me a little bit as well this season when he's been fit. So, I mean, you know, could you get another left back in? You know, Monreal's getting on a bit now. People saying he's not good enough. We'll have to wait and see. But I think, you know, maybe adding a bit more depth on the wing or, or bringing another centre back in. We don't know what the the, the future of Kashani's going to be like. Obviously, there's been a lot of speculation about him leaving. So, um, I mean, it, it, some, some of it does depend on, on other players we already have because, I mean, before the season started, I I wasn't so sure on Awobi, but he has proved me and quite a few Arsenal fans wrong so far. I think he's been absolutely fantastic. He look he's looking like a totally different player. So you know you've then got that question: Do do we need to bring another winger in um, to, to you know to to give him maybe maybe it would be good to give him a bit of competition. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about um, this. Uh, uh, Pepe or whatever his name is at Lille. I'm not sure if that yeah. is the right name. I hope so. But um, and um, obviously Dembele and Malcolm, uh, their futures at Barcelona are uncertain. You know, maybe if we could get a cheeky little deal with one of them, loan deal, even if it's a loan deal, and I think it'll still be a good deal to try and just add a bit of depth and quality to to the squad. You know, so we'll have to wait and see on that one. Yep, uh, Reese Nelson, would you bring him back from his loan deal? Now, I'm very much of the opinion that if you've sent him out on loan. You need to just accept the fact that he's not going to be a part of the squad this season and let him go and do what he's been sent out to do, and that's develop. And, and so I definitely wouldn't be pulling him back. I don't know if you agree, Chris. No, I totally agree with you, Harry. He's been sent out on loan to get some more first-team football and to get some, some some experience and obviously to improve as a footballer. And he's he's been absolutely fantastic for Hoffenheim so far, as we've all seen. You know, he's been scoring, he's been assisting pretty much near enough every week. I um, mean, he's doing very well. His, his confidence is obviously very high. And, you know, he's playing under a top top manager at the moment, under Julian Nagelsmann, who's been fantastic with young players. 
um, and improving them. So I think he needs to stay there for the remainder of the season um, and just keep doing what he's been doing because he's been brilliant. And, um, you know, no doubt he'll be an important, and hopefully he will be an important, I don't want him leaving, of course, hopefully he will be an important part of Arsenal's future going forward. Yeah, definitely, totally agree. Um, this next question, I'm going to move on because just conscious of time. So this next question mm. comes from Graham Sutherland, who's actually a new listener. He sent us a really nice message last week uh, talking about how much he enjoyed the show. So welcome on board, Graham, and I hope you'll be listening going forward. Now, his question is, Czech or Leno? For me, it's time to go back to Czech for a while, I think. Um, I'm a bit torn on this one. Chris, Czech or Leno? Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit surprised you'd, you'd want to go back with Czech because I think actually Leno's been doing all right. Um, you know, um, don't get me wrong, Czech was actually doing all right, you know, before he, he got dropped. Um, you know, obviously he still has shaky moments now and again, and they do give me... Um, many panic attacks. Um, I think they do everyone. But so you know, you know, he's um, in on that respect with Czech. Um, that does worry me. And I think you know he's lucky that it actually hasn't cost him um, or cost us uh, some goals so far. Um, so I, you know, I think with Leno, he's younger. I think he's got um, a better ability as a goalkeeper than Czech has now. I think Czech is obviously getting on a bit now and isn't as good as he used to be. Um, Leno, Leno's a top quality goalkeeper in my opinion he's obviously had a few shaky moments as well but he's obviously getting used to um, playing out from the back how Emery wants him to um, but um, I think he's made some very very important saves for us so far when he's played and kept us in the game as well uh, so I think it should be uh, Leno moving forward OK and uh, another question has come from Paul Bradley at Paul Bradley 1998 on Twitter he asks what do you think of Mkhitaryan I'm assuming he wants to know our thoughts on him, his Arsenal career overall. If you can hear noises in the background, I do apologise. <laughs> same here, same fireworks here. Fireworks everywhere. <laughs> uh, that and my wife is devouring a packet of chocolate biscuits as well in the same room and you can hear the rustling. So apologies about that. Um, but yeah, going back to the question, Henrik Mkhitaryan, Chris, what are your thoughts? Um, Mkhitaryan, um, I think he can actually be um, a very good player on, on, on his day, but... Um, I think he's he's struggling at the moment. I don't think he's in good form. Um, maybe it might be a confidence thing. Obviously, he was being dropped by a Wobi, um, and, and you know he wasn't he wasn't hasn't been playing an awful lot. Um, but um, you know, I think um, I think he could be a very good player, and I think he can be an important player for us. I think he just needs to get maybe get a little bit of confidence back up. Um, I think you know some of his uh, decision making in the game the other night was questionable, but. Um, you know, I, I think I hope he gets his form back, and I hope he gets his confidence back because I think he could be a, a good player and a very important player as well. Whether it's in the cup game, especially in the Europa League as well, um, you know, I think his partnership with Aubameyang can be can be very uh, lethal as well. Um, obviously, with Özil and Lacazette in the team anyway, so I, I hope he can get that confidence back up and um, and be be you know that 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 Mkhitaryan we knew a few years back. Yes, yeah, certainly. And this is a question from me, actually, Chris, something I just thought of now while we were talking. Do you mm. think that, you know, during this whole Aaron Ramsey saga, Mkhitaryan's wages have been highlighted a number of times, haven't they? People talking about what he's earning in comparison to what Ramsey has sort of asked for. Do you think that's put increased scrutiny on his performances? Oh, I don't know. I mean... Um... I know, obviously, like you just said, there's always a lot of people talk about player wages, and obviously, with this whole Aaron Ramsey saga, it's probably, um, you know, it never helps speculation wise. But I, th I think, you know, Mkhitaryan won't be fussed by it too much. I think he'll just want to be concentrating on on um, on his football. You, to be fair, I mean, just like any other football usually does. Um, and you know, Emery Emery has been quite vocal and when he's been saying he wants all of the players focused and he's only concentrate even when he's been asked about these contracts things with Ramsey you know he doesn't go into too much detail he just wants to focus on the team and mm -hmm. I think that'll be exactly with Mkhitaryan and his football um, so I'd, I'd like to think that obviously hasn't disturbed him um, with his performances yep lovely uh, the final question is from Ben Kent uh, on Twitter he's asked uh, our opinion on the Ramsey situation now I've already gone into this at quite uh, length earlier on in the episode. So I'm not going to answer this one again. Um, but just quickly, Chris, from your point of view, do you believe that he should be still playing as many games as he is, despite not having signed a contract? 
Um, yeah, I do, to be honest, Harry, because I think he's still an Arsenal, Arsenal man. You know, obviously he's been at the club for a number of years, been a very important player for us. He knows the club inside out. Um, and I'm actually a little bit disappointed about the news of him going. If obviously it does happen, I personally wanted him to stay. Um, but, um, you know, uh, I think, you know, Emery, Emery knows what's going on in his head. Um, and if he didn't think he would, you know, he was uh, in the right frame of mind to play, I don't think he'd be playing him. Um, but like I said, he's an Arsenal boy um, and knows the club inside out and been actually a very important player for us when you look back at the goals he scored. Um, so um, I think he, you know, he does, con- you know, deserve to continue play as many games as he is at the moment. I suppose. Great, great stuff, Chris. Unfortunately, due to time, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, thank you once again for coming on. Do you want to quickly let our listeners know once more how they can follow you on social media and keep up with all the breaking Arsenal news that you provide us on Twitter? Yeah, cheers, Harry. Thanks for having me on again. Um, my Twitter handle is at C Davidson underscore AFC. Um, obviously, like you just meant, I'm posting all the latest news and all football bits and bobs. So uh, make sure you give us a follow. Oh, wait, before we do go, hold on. I can't not let, mm. I can't not ask you about this, can I? Just before we've gone on to record, news has broken that Arsene Wenger may be in line to take the AC Milan job. Do you think that's mm. possible, given that we thought his relationship with Ivan Gazidis had broken down? Could it be possible that they yeah. could be reunited? Yeah, I mean, it's a funny one, isn't it? I mean, obviously, looking back at the speculation between and surrounding Wenger and Gazidis before, you know, it was questionable. But, you know, will the truth come out in the end? You know, who was behind Wenger's second? Maybe we'll find out soon enough or in the future. But, um, you know, I, 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 whoever Wenger ends up with team-wise, I'll be very happy for him. You know, I just want him to see him back in the game and, uh, you know, being successful. He deserves it, in my opinion. That's right. Totally agree. Chris, I'll actually let you go this time. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, we'll speak again in the very near future. Cheers, Harry. Take care. hero. He's a smart guy who loves sports and loves outwitting other people. Our hero needs to show the world his mastery of the game. Our hero does this by playing games at Loserpool. Our hero is you. Loserpool has two games. In the namesake, the games of an entire season are grouped together into weeks or rounds. After paying an entry fee, you choose one team to lose that week or round. If you're correct, you earn the right to repeat the process in the next round. But the catch is that you cannot choose a team a second time until all the teams have been chosen by you once. If you're knocked out early, you may re-enter the same pool by paying a penalty to make it fair for the other players. Or you may wait until the next pool starts in a few weeks. Razor Pool is similar to Loser Pool in that the games of an entire season are grouped together. But in this case, you pay the entry fee and predict the outcome of all the games in that week or round. You will be ranked against all other players according to your accuracy. And at the end of each round, a predetermined percentage of players will be eliminated. There is no option to buy back into a pool if you are eliminated. (laughs) And so you will have to wait until the next pool starts to play again. In both games, the prize money grows very rapidly. The pool is allocated to the last man standing, or to add a little drama, to a small surviving group if they vote according to predetermined rules. Loser Pool is about community, friendship, fun and rivalry. Discuss and debate the games and events of the week with players from around the world. Invite your friends and co-workers into your own sub-pools and see who can outsmart the group and earn bragging rights. This is your moment. Create an account. Show your sports genius. Be the hero.